I declare the meeting open to the public. For those in the public gallery uh, are welcome to use the mobile devices as long as they are in, in airplane mode on all devices when needed. You are welcome to connect to the assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available in the gallery rules. Uh, it is not permitted to take photographs uh, or record any of the meeting. Can I have any apologies? Have we any apologies? I think I'd want to put you in order today again. Back on Michael here. Okay. okay. Other agenda item three. Minutes of the meeting of 23rd of February 2016. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the meeting of 23rd of February 2016 at pages 6 to 10? Are members content that the draft minutes are accurate? Yep. If so, I will sign. Four models rising. Can refer members to models rising at pages 14 to 90. Can I advise members that the committee has been invited to a regional review of the recent flooding convened by the Minister at Lockery College, Kirkstown, on Wednesday, the 16th of March 2016, from 9:30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Further details, including the agenda for the day and terms of reference for the review, are provided in your table of papers. May I ask members to indicate whether they are willing or available to attend as soon as possible so that the necessary arrangements can be made. Can I also refer members to a copy of the map that the Rivers Agency provided during the committee's visit to the Loch Ness Sluice Gates in your table papers. Members content to action the rest of the matters rising as suggested on the index sheet at page 12 to 13. Okay, members. Mm -hmm. Item. So and item five. Uh, we have an order briefed on health and safety executive of Northern Ireland from the <coughs> The prime members to papers provided by the health and safety executive and table papers. We're just um, coming in. We're just waiting on them coming in. George Lucas, Chairman of Farm Safety Partnership, Ian Marshall, also former junior, Keith Morrison, uh, Chief Executive, AFS uh, ENI, and Brian Monson, Deputy Chief Executive of AHS ENI. You're very welcome. I'm uh, just asking you to take up to 10 minutes for your presentation and then we ask some questions, okay? Okay, thanks Thank very much. Thank you, Chair. You've already tried to <coughs> acknowledge my colleagues, so I'll move on. Thank you very much for inviting us today. Um, the unacceptable death uh, toll on farms in Northern Ireland is something which the partners take very seriously. Um, in the past 10 years, there have been 68 fatalities within the industry, with six fatalities in the most recent calendar year. So on the basis of last year's figures, it is clear that things must continue to change if together we're to prevent another 60 farmers or farm families dying over the next decade. It is important to realise that all farm accidents are preventable. Farming is not unique in terms of hazard or risk, but it has still not moved sufficiently forward and step with other industries in the last 10 years. That's not to say that they're not world-class farms with uh, first-rate health and safety practices. There are. But we need to ensure that Northern Ireland's farms are acknowledged for the quality of produce they produce, not an unacceptably high death or injury rate. We need farmers to embrace risk management for the sake of themselves and their families and their farm. The major cause of the accident from the analysis is four main causes. Animals, falls, equipment, for example tractors and machinery, and slurry. And there are clearly issues to be addressed in each one of those. These form the core of our safe 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 campaign and messaging. Fundamentally, however, there is a need for all within the industry to <coughs> adopt safe working as a way of life, regardless of activity or hazard. We need to see a further change of behaviour and mindset, away from an attitude of it will never happen to me, 
away from the idea that doing things safely, it can't be done, or it's too costly, or it takes too much time. We need people to realise that by taking very simple, straightforward, cost-effective steps, the job can be done safely and efficiently. We are making progress, but it needs to be maintained, and there is much still to be done. I should explain that this is not just a Northern Ireland issue, it is a worldwide one. From a recent newspaper article in The Scotsman, it is estimated that there are approximately a thousand farm deaths in the European Union as a whole. But specifically in Northern Ireland, since the very challenging years of 2011 and 2012, when 12 farmers were killed in both years, and when the Farm Safety Partnership was established, we have seen a reduction in farm deaths to an average of six per year in the last three years. This is clearly too many tragedies on our farms, but it is progress. But while the focus is often on farm deaths, there are many more life-changing injuries which occur which affect individuals and families. The Farm Safety Partnership is working well. It is committed at the most senior levels. It is getting things done. It speaks with one voice and it uses individual reach and influence in a collective way to achieve a much greater impact than any of the partners could do individually. As Chairman, I am grateful for all the partners for their contribution. Our partnership model and initiatives campaign are seen as good practice by colleagues in GB and in the Republic of Ireland. We are making progress through the second Farm Safety <coughs> Action Plan, and we are confident that the vast majority of the actions will be completed. The partnership is already turning its mind to the next phase for the next five years for a new plan. It's important to thank everyone involved. I thank uh, the settlement for HSNE for 1617, which effectively protects <coughs> the important farm safety work. Uh, this is uh, allowing the valuable momentum which has been built up to continue into next year. I also very much welcome the support DARD provides to the campaign and the work of the partnership. The Detty and Dart ministers have been very supportive of the partnership and its work. I am enormously grateful for the MLAs and the Ard and Etty committees for their support of the campaign's work at farm safety events, and I am grateful for all MLAs who have supported the issue. As you can see from the paper presented, together we are making a real difference to the lives of our farming communities. In conclusion, it is unfortunate but clear that there is no quick fix available to Farm Safety Challenge. If there were, we would know about it and we would already be applying it. The four main causes are slurry, animals, falls, equipment. The safe message remains the key issue going forward. Sustainability of action in this area is another key challenge if we maintain the momentum the partnership has built up. We are working with colleagues in GB and the South to try and share costs and resources and we're working with the wider agri-food sector to see how they can help. The Farm Safety Partnership is committed to making sure this issue remains a priority for the coming years. Only this way can we avoid the heartache of being still experienced on our farms. Your continued support in this area is very much appreciated. Thank you again for inviting us today to discuss this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And no one else at this stage? No? OK. Thank Happy you very to much. respond to any questions you may have, Chair. That's, sure. that's, that's fully yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I suppose I can declare an interest in a farmer myself, and we all realise that one simple mistake can can create a fatality. Um, I know you've had a number of initiatives over the years uh, to try and help us farm safely. And one that gets very uh, highlighted uh, a lot has been the story gas. And it does look like people have begun to catch on and are, are, you know, rates are quite low. I see last year there was no more story gas. There's been four really in total, which is sad, of course, but over the last Sorry. six to nine. So it looks like people are beginning to realise the full danger of story gas. But some of the ones that people maybe don't fully like falls, 15 people over the years have died of falls. And, uh, in effect, slurry gases have been actually very low in deaths, while it has got a very large headline, I suppose, through one very major incident. But um, do you believe that 
your own campaign has helped in regard in highlighting the, the issue of slurry gases to reduce deaths in that regard? I think we did. I think, Chairman, the uh, tragic incident, uh, as you referred to there, really uh, highlighted in everyone's mind. And I think it, you know, that caught the imagination, I think, of things needing to improve in that regard. Uh, tragic as it was, it, uh, so there has been some progress in ter terms of you know, catching the imagination and realise how dangerous it is. Particularly in those first 30 seconds, you know, you're essentially in a gas chamber. It's a farm for the rest of the time, but for those four or five days a year, you know, it's essentially a gas chamber you're going into, and that spike in the first 30 seconds of, mi of mixing is so, so dangerous. You're essentially in a chemical plant at that stage, and I think more and more farmers are beginning to realise that that's the case. Uh, do you see equipment still as the main cause of death? Uh, on farms, that's machinery and equipment. Um, do you think there's any more can be done? To I know there has been a lot of, uh, you, you know, the organisation has highlighted uh, this, uh, but still continues to be quite high. Actually, last year was the highest for a number of years. I think in all the four areas, um, you know, there, there's ongoing work to be done in, in that context, and certainly. Uh, equipment is is the major killer, so you know that's I guess where most of the focus has been uh, in that regard. But uh, I don't know whether Brian would like to say anything. Certainly, in terms of moving things forward, equipment and foals are two that have been identified as key priorities at the moment. Uh, we are looking at producing um, guidance similar to that that was produced for slurry, which is very very simple basic guidance with some key things that people can do because we know that a big concern is I can't afford to do this or it takes too much time. So for for example with tractors we're looking at later in this year having a spotlight week and, and getting across a thing called the safe stop message and properly stopping a vehicle and parking it would have reduced an awful lot of the incidents that have been seen across the islands. So to get that information out in a simple way and to promote that and then to use the partnership so that all of the partners are contributing to that information going out and to raise awareness of the <coughs> simple things that can be done and along with that using people who have had incidents to demonstrate the fact that if they had carried out those simple things the consequences would have been much, much less than where they are and we are immensely thankful for the people who have had tragic incidents and who have been seriously injured who have actually come forward and we have produced videos with them and those videos are very very strong in getting those messages uh, across so that's an approach that we are well aware of and it's, it's one that we are continuing to push on. Uh, just one more before I hand over to my colleagues. Um, <coughs> suppose being a farmer myself I really, most farmers don't expect to be killed by an animal and still all over those years 18 farmers have been killed by animals. And in statistics, I used to always think it was bulls, but in many cases it's not. It can be a cow with a calf. Uh, and I think in the main that's <coughs> more than bulls. So I think there's a big message that needs to be got out there, because we, I think farmers that work with animals all the time don't fully realise the risk of animals, because they're working with animals every day of the week. So, I mean, I think more needs to be done in that regard too. That's a fair point. It's the old thing about familiarity breeding contempt, unfortunately, isn't it? You know, yeah. you're working with something day and daily, and then all of a sudden... That's right. And, and I think people expect bulls to be dangerous, but <coughs> it's the animal that you don't expect sometimes can be. Especially when you're going to end trying to help or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. there, are, there are opportunities to do more on animals. We've done some of the survivor stories work um, in and around someone who had a, a near miss with an animal. We run spotlight weeks. So we have focused on PTO gardening in the past. It's the sort of thing that over the next year, two years, we can we can consider. Um, it is it is I suppose breaking that mindset of of people who see an animal every day and uh, will take a risk, but the effects and, and the consequences of that actually it only takes as you as you well know a particular challenge for older farmers as well who are less mobile and sometimes don't plan just an escape route here or there. Or for younger farmers that think they're more agile than they actually are. Um, but again, it's, it's an area that will stay in focus for us moving forward. There's no doubt about that. OK. Sean, Sean Martin. Thanks. I um, see so declaring interest as somebody who does a bit of farming as well. But you, 
In terms of, you know, and particularly in stringent financial times that all farmers are in now, and maybe that tendency maybe to take, take sh shortcuts, and let's face it, just not the money to do maintenance to replace that shed roof and so on. What opportunities, I know there's some opportunities within the business development groups uh, for to, to look into farm safety. What opportunities do you think should be available within, within other schemes to improve farm safety? I think colleagues from 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 Dor are behind us. Um, I've I, I came from Dor. I, I worked in Dor for for many years before I moved to the Health and Safety Executive, particularly with the Rural Development Programme, and it provides numerous opportunities to, to to progress farm safety. You will have, as you say, the, the business development groups aspect of that, and as a partnership, we've been exceptionally keen to make sure that. The discussion group element is being formed. Whilst, of course, we'll understand the focus will be on dairy or beef and, and, and improving production, the partnership and there's been a commitment from DORD and from those who will be attending those groups to keep safety well up the agenda on each of those groups. You've then got the investment side um, of the Rural Development Programme in terms of the new scheme that's coming along there in relation to improving farm businesses. Um, and some quite large scale opportunities there as well as smaller scale ones. And again, partnerships have been working hard with DORD, but importantly as a partnership to agree that safety should play a part in assessing those and there should be opportunities for people to um, replace things or to uh, invest in, in new systems that will, will keep them safe on the farm. Okay. And you know, your, your, the statistics of the number of people killed on our farms is chilling. But the other statistics out there that we haven't got is those people have been injured. And some people have been quite seriously injured, you know, by parting off shops, whatever. So are, there any, are those statistics available anywhere? Uh, we've just completed, again, with the help of, of the hard colleagues, the, the partnership has completed a survey of, I think, 4,600 farmers. And it was specifically uh, to address that point. Um, in other industries, they will report incidents. Um, in farming, you, sometimes you'll hear about it, sometimes you won't. A farmer will dust himself off, go to hospital and come back and get stuck into work again. Um, some interesting results coming out of that survey, we're still just crunching the numbers on it, but again that would suggest exactly what you've said, that there are a significant number of accidents every month that will require some form of hospital treatment. Um, and again, the difference between you know, what is classed as a serious incident that might keep you off work for a week or for three months. Um, a couple of seconds could make all the difference and turn that into a fatality. Working on your own could turn that into a fatality. A couple of inches could turn that into a fatality. So we're very mindful that if you can focus on those most serious incidents, you will prevent the, 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 the fatalities. But put simply, there are still too many happening every month. Um, and again, we want to keep the focus on that. The causation factors that are coming back from, from that report seem to suggest the same sorts of things. Um, so again, the focus is, is right for us. But we might tweak, you know, there'll be some information about quads, for example. And again, we can use that to tweak messages. So um, we're gathering that information. As soon as it's finalised, we can certainly make it available to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Chair. Can I thank you for your briefing? And I think we've all seen the, the very successful Stop and Think Safe TV adverts. So they are very hard hitting. But can I commend you for that campaign? That was an, an excellent campaign. Um, what feedback have you received from these adverts? And what's the next step? Because, uh, note, George, you said that it had to be valuable momentum and sustainability of action. So. Given the, the impact on the were very, very good, very good campaign, what do you do next? How do you follow that one? Okay, Brian, do you want to do with other? Yeah, I cer certainly, Chair, the, the feedback so far has been very good. Uh, similar to the DOE adverts, the road, the road safety adverts, uh, hard hitting, and there's, there's no ambiguity about, ambiguity about the message here. Uh, it resonates with most people because most farm businesses are, in fact, family, family business, yeah. as well as the farm business. So certainly it has been effective as regards where now I think this, this process always was initially about raising awareness, but it's about making sure that, that we keep that level of awareness. And that momentum that, going. Keep the momentum going, exactly, and make sure that health and safety becomes an integral part of how we all do business on farms. And it's it, rather than being an afterthought, which is historically was very often, but it's it's one of the first thoughts we say when we consider doing something, because we are aware of financial pressures at the moment, <coughs> time constraints, 
very often you know there are shortcuts and, and people try and save money but that being said this partnership has, has demonstrated that if we work together on this and, and you know the gentlemen to my, to my right their regulatory their statutory body however that being said they've demonstrated that it doesn't always need to be the stick approach that the carrot stick approach is, is, is applicable in this case and by working together we have certainly affected the amount of accidents Given the tragedies which George has outlined and that should never underplay the dangers, I know my husband's a big farmer himself. It's great to see your Be Aware Kids Child Safety campaign as well. So, can you maybe update us on that and how you're linking up with schools and youth groups? Sure, uh -huh. Brian, do you want to? Okay, we're continuing with the programme that we have in terms of inspectors visiting schools. So um, we would hope to visit uh, over 70 rural primary schools in the period between Easter and the summer holidays. Okay. We'll have a child safety focus week, which will be in June prior to children coming off for the school holidays, because that's a very important time to raise that message. Through work that we have done with young farmers, uh, young I was farmers. About to come on to that. I see Michael's up behind. You Michael's again. behind. <laughs> um, Michael has been great. As uh, your arm, arm up your back. <laughs> Not <laughs> quite. <laughs> <laughs> but the young farmers now, we have had, uh, I think, six people trained who are young farmers who are now trained to deliver child safety messages to other young farmers groups and other community groups. So that's increasing that spread. Um, We've also worked, for example, with, uh, we're currently looking at working with health visitors uh, and looking at providing similar training to health visitors or school nurses so that they're aware of the key issues. Um, we're working currently with University of Ulster, Jordanstown, or University of Ulster, sorry, at McGee campus, the nursing um, faculty, who have developed a child safety app which runs on, on various mobile devices and links in with our child safety video. Um, this was a student project which we have felt merits taking further and we're actually looking at supporting that to bring it to the market. Now it will become a free app which is available and will tie in with all that's going on. And importantly too, there's a lot of work that has gone on with guides. We have over 3,000 um, brownies and rainbows who have now completed their farm safety badge. And a great thank you to the guide movement for all their support in that. And we're hoping now to roll that to some of the other youth groups as well, so Scouts, BBGB and the like. That's excellent, because as we know, farm safety skills have learned uh, at a young age will stay with people throughout their careers. And I was going to ask you about your links with Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, but you assure me they're very, very strong. Is that right, Michael? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so it's important that that link is, is so vital because those are our farmers of the future. Um, how do you continue that message then through the young farmers? Is that an ongoing process throughout the groups as well? Or what plans specifically with the young farmers have you in the pipeline? Well, we're continuing to do uh, work with the young farmers. Health and safety has been brought up on the agenda so that it's something now that, would, that, that appears with individual groups. And we're encouraging, again, ambassadors to be trained who can then visit as peers. It's young farmers talking to young farmers about, child sa or about young farmer safety issues and about good practice. We're continuing to run, for example, tractor driving competition, which is run regionally and then has a, a final at Balmoral, which, again, is a key area because safe tractor driving, as we've already said, machinery is one of our key issues. And that's about instilling good practice at an early age which is key. And we're also looking at, at whether we can work together with other partnerships. Uh, we've had a successful piece with the Farm Safety Foundation in GB, who have sponsored um, a awareness day at Greenmount College. So all first year uh, students who were at Greenmount spent a half day looking at real scenarios of accidents and discussing uh, how they could have been prevented. So we're also, as well as young farmers, looking at the, the colleges as well as another opportunity. OK, because Keith said something about the, the personal stories, and farmers do think it's not going to happen to them, it'll be someone else. So I think it's very, very important to get those personal stories out there because they are they are so vital. You no, know, just commend you, you're doing a good job. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you, Chair, and thanks for your, present, <coughs> your presentation. And I too would like to say there well done to the, all of you, you know, for the work that you have done. Um, the, the, the couple of points I was going to ask have been asked, so there's no point in repeating this all or repeating it. But a couple of wee points mm. I would like to ask is, in terms of deaths and injuries, you know, 
Does your study go into, say, the like of um, a type of farm? Is it a small small holdings? No, the bigger holdings. Who escapes the best? And uh, <coughs> the second point would be, I suppose it's the time of year. You know, you've run into this. You know, when more busier busier periods. And the third point I would like to make is, um, do you find the deaths and injuries are among farm owners or or <coughs> employees? And, <coughs> Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of the survey work, the survey allows us to break that down by farm size, by farm type, main activity. It also lets us look at the degree of severity of incidents from minor up to the most major, and then say for a particular sector, what are the most likely causes and how, what are the severities. So that will help us in the future target where the messages are best placed and how we can best support, for example, if there are discussion groups in dairy, what are the key issues for that group to spend their time working on. In terms of who's being injured and killed, there have, unfortunately, the majority will be farmers on their own farms, and that's the nature of the, the makeup of our industry. But there have been a number of people who have uh, in, in instances where there have been employees, where there have been children, unfortunately. Um, or where there have been neighbours who have come to help and who have been either injured or killed as a result. Uh, the vast majority, however, would be to the farmers themselves. Yeah, <coughs> no, that, that, that covers the, the points that I want to make. I just think there, you know, the industry <coughs> is a lot different from you know, your run of the mill industries out there, you know, because you know, other industries there would be very conscious of health and safety and about claims and about everything else, while the farm, I suppose, is. As your own, and you, you never think like that, you know. So, you know, well done in the efforts that you've done, and good luck for the future. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jay. No, it's one of, I could just say, it's one of the most the fundamental problems of most other industries, mm -hmm. you know, that there's someone to challenge the person. That's right. When you're working right. on your own, you know, get that challenge to the same extent. Now, obviously, we're trying to get that by way it's really integrated in, as Ian has mentioned, and it becomes part of risk management of every job. And then we get the families involved are trying to help reinforce it. I don't know, all those things, it'll eventually take root, but it'll take time. It's looking really like a 10-year project, you know, and we make progress every year, please God. OK. Thanks, Chair. Certainly, Sydney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, and, uh, I, too, will congratulate you on all the work that you're doing and, and to trying to, to uh, minimise accidents and deaths on farms. It's, it's an ongoing issue, and I say one death is uh, too many, and we have to try and get to that situation <coughs> where there's none. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but I uh, certainly appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, you, you talked about mindset, George, I think, at the, at the start and changing mindsets, you know, and especially coming into the summer months when the young ones are all off school and all, you know, there's nothing uh, as more uh, attractive to young people is to work on the farm with, with their parents and things like that. And say, uh, what, what work maybe changing mindsets is okay. It's hard to change uh, the mindset of someone who's been a farmer. Uh, for a, a long number of years, but you know, at what stage do you start to change the future, young know, the, the farmers of the future, uh, in working say with schools and things like that, to to educate them the dangers of, of farming and going forward? Is there any work that you're doing there that you could be doing say with the school? No, it's a very good question on changing the, the mindset. Really, is at an early stage, yeah, uh, say, very, uh, very much so. I mean, all the work that Brian alluded to, you know, we're we're doing in terms of schools and primary schools mm. that goes on. And all the communication that we're doing, you know, the adverts, the guide movement, all the different things. At the end of the day, it's really very important. I think that that whole awareness gets across to everyone just how dangerous it is, and that each individual farmer and their families start to challenge the thinking of what went on in the past, because like all industries, uh, you've got to learn from what worked well and continue to apply it. Uh, the difficulty with this is if you don't integrate health and safety because it wasn't there before, you've got to start making sure it is integrated into some processes. In, in the past, uh, farming has evolved to such an extent with all the machinery and the different everything that it's developed, and certainly it's something that uh, it, it's a it's an environment now. It's it's a workplace that uh, can be quite dangerous uh, if you only take your eye off the ball for for a few seconds, Absolutely. and say even with the young people and all that. So. Uh, I think uh, I say I know the good work that you're doing there, but farming, farming, and farmers being busy people that they are, uh, sometimes they, they would tell you they don't have enough hours in the day to get their work done. It's 24/7, and uh, 
it, it's uh, maybe a, a lapse of maybe just for a few seconds and cause it could have devastating results. But I think we do have to change mindsets going forward. And, and, and with the young people, maybe that would be an avenue that could be could be challenged, uh, challenged, challenged through uh, going into the future. Sure not, uh, but that's a crucial of what we're trying. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. And that? If I could just add that through the chair, the interesting thing that, is, that has come out of this piece of work is that very often you have as much impact not communicating with alpha male, the farm owner or operator, but by sons, daughters, children, grandchildren, partners, peer pressure, pester power, whatever you want to call it. Very often when you speak to younger people who have minds that are very much blank canvas and like a sponge, they absorb this stuff and they in turn will relate that stuff to, to, to more senior members, maybe working on the farm. So very often the message that we're communicating is just as important to, to touch base with the other elements that are part of that family structure of that farm business. And by virtue of that, you can change the behaviour of, of the more established member in the farm. Okay, thank you. I think that's one of the other advantages, Chair, uh, of the partnership, you know, where we've had farmers talking to farmers or young farmers talking to young farmers. And it's a much more powerful message when people that are respected and are experts in the field rather than someone like myself standing and preaching at people, you know, it comes over extremely well. Well, old standards are hard to, 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 to change, and I say, uh, my view and say, it would be uh, changing that mindset, and that's what you touched on. I think that's crucial that we can get that mindset changed going into the future with the younger type person coming through into the farming. Uh, that would be, be a big plus for everybody going yeah. forward. Sure. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Ian, Ian McRae. Yeah, apologise for the earlier part of your presentation, and if my questions really been asked, um, apologies as well. But nonetheless, I, I, I do truly want to echo the comments that have been made in respect of the, the work that you just do. Um, as someone who not necessarily um, buys into the advertisements that, that go on TV around the the um, Road safety and all the rest of it, and whilst I believe they're effective, um, that's something that I, you know, I know some people are impacted by them that maybe they've been through it, but did not necessarily do it for me. And I don't think sometimes they're strong enough message that that is, is, is sent out. Um, and as Sydney said, and I'm sure others, like one death, whether it's on our roads or on, our, on, a, on a farm, is one too many. But <coughs> Keith will know certainly in respect of the. Advert the, the TV advert that was out around the the reverse, you know, aspect of an accident on the farm. And personally, I thought, and we had the conversation. I thought that was probably one of the more effective ones that I that I saw in respect of whether it's you know um, the DOE in respect of road safety or, or or this one. So I commend you for that, and I have spoken to people who are in the farming industry who. Did you know can fully understand the impact that, that could have? So I think it's in that sense, and, and I always you know in, in respect of advertising. How do you feel that, and given the, that recent advert that um, was carried out, the effectiveness of it? Have you ha had much of a feedback in respect of that? And you know what's the plans for the next stage? Yeah, we can give you some some very positive feedback on it. Um, but also to say that we're mindful that media changes. So, you know, a TV advert that, that works now that costs a lot of money isn't viewed by everybody. Um, social media is playing a big part of this as well. So we're trying to create products that actually can be deployed in a, in a number of ways. But if you're spending money on advertising like that, uh, you need to know that it is having an impact. So we've commissioned studies to see from the farmers themselves who helped us design the, the advertising and um, what impact it was having. A couple of highlights that I have. This was done just before Christmas, so this is really hot off the press. 85% of respondents agreed that the advertising would encourage them to think about safety on the farm. That's fine, that's awareness. 78% agreed they'd already been influenced by the campaign to protect themselves by accident, so again, that starts to get the impact. Brian will update you on some of the questions we asked, which were specifically about behavioural change, and then trying to find out more information from that about what you would do next. Brian has a detail of it. Yeah, again, um, you know, some of the questions that were in this, have you actually taken steps 
to make things safer as a result of seeing the campaign in general, because it's not just the television advert. We had a series of radio adverts, and there's stuff in the press um, and editorial. 79% of those that responded said that they had taken steps as a result of the campaign and all the work that has gone on. Um, we've also seen, um, haven't got the, the exact number, but it exceeded 80% who said that they, as a result of seeing this, had had conversations with either other farmers or family members about farm safety. And again, one of the things we were in, uh, very keen to do was encourage not only behavioural change of the farmer, but the conversations around the table uh, around some of those key issues. So there's evidence to say the advertising um, is, is being effective. We are having hit rates in terms of both people seeing it and the response to it, which is higher than would be expected for an advertising campaign. And whilst that's there, I think it's important that we look at extending that to ensure that we're getting that as, across to as many people as possible and we continue moving towards that behavioural change. Uh, and to be honest with you, it sort of, sort of goes in line with any of the conversations I've had with, with people, you know, they have had has opened that conversation at, around the, the table and even to some extent in farmer markets as such, you know, where people are talking about it. So I think it has been effective and um, I suppose my follow-on is more so around the DOE obviously do the road safety campaigns and there's road safety road shows that, that go around the country um, and alongside with the, the police and I think maybe Cool FM or something are involved in as well. Have you had any conversations with that side of it? Because you know, the reality is they're bringing school children in and certainly in my own constituency, two thirds of the constituency is rural. Therefore, there's a high possibility that you know, at least 50% of that are, are from a farming background. So it is something maybe, I don't know whether it has been or hasn't been, but I think it's something worth looking at to see, is it something that the, you know, with the health and safety executive in, in partnership with, or whether it's something that has already been discussed. So, yeah. yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's a piece of work that we have we have been doing, um, and and will continue to do. So, with colleagues in the likes of young farmers clubs, you've got you've got a captive audience there. So again, training those folks to be able to say and start their meetings with that gets you that audience, that 60, 70 people there. We're also, as a health and safety executive, involved, involved with the likes of PSNI, the Electricity Board, TransLink, and what are called BeSafe events. Um, and there was one in Mid Ulster, I think it was Dungannon there last week, where 600 young people were busted. I've been to these things, they're busted in, and they'll spend you know, 10 minutes talking about cyber security, yeah. um, 10 minutes on ours, usually in, in the kitchen, and, and, and working with people in terms of farm safety. The other aspect of what we've been trying to do, and again trying to just expand that reach, is working with the Radar Centre down at the Harper Estate. Um, and again, anybody who's been in there is a fantastic facility, and there's a farm safety uh, display demonstration in there, so that that's that's a venue that lots of schools and young people will use for road safety, for um, fire safety, and again, farm safety is well up there and along with other people. So, But we're always looking for ideas in terms of that, just getting the message out. That's where we're trying to do some work with what we would call affiliates. There's a lot of uh, people in the agri-food sector, a lot of companies in the agri-food sector who have much more reach than we would have and sometimes more influence, frankly, than we would have. And again, trying to work with them as affiliates to the partnership to say, how can you use your contact with your customers, um, with your shoppers, with your employees uh, to get a farm safety message out? So it's just trying to extend that reach and influence as, as widely as we possibly can. But we're always open to open the ideas in March and all sorts of things. Now, listen, again, I commend you on the work you're doing. Certainly someone who believes in you know, the online presence and social media and whatnot, I think kids or whether you like it or not that's that's a, a big thing for for kids and um you know if you could get some form of a advert to come up on playstations halfway through a game would be even you know <laughs> more effective but certainly you know you, you I, would see it then. i would you know, can only but commend you on the work you're doing and keep it up but i certainly know if, if a friend who lost an arm in a farming accident and He's no better advert for farm safety, and goes around, you know, many 
you know, church events Williams and different Ayers. the Williams Ayers, yeah, and like he's very passionate about arm safety and works in it and you know, has shown that you have so, you know, someone with a disability because of a farming accident has lived a normal life and you know, one of the like when we were a bit younger was one of the best drivers in Northern Ireland, you know, with one arm. So, you know, I think it's certainly um there are benefits to that, but as I say, there's no better advert for it than somebody who's been through it and and um, well, and, and I must acknowledge William because he has made a significant contribution, you know, he was recognised recently for an award and yeah. He is a tremendous man as well, isn't he, in all facets? Thank you. Thank you. Paul, were you looking in? Just very quick, Nick. Um, I apologise for not being here for your presentation, but I uh, commend you for all the work that you're doing on, on farm safety because the farm now is the most dangerous place to work in. Uh, it, it's not one of them, it is the most dangerous place to work in. And can I make a suggestion that your leaf that's going out should be gone out with every form it's sent out from agriculture, no matter what form it is. And indeed, the supermarkets there should be doing the same as well. It should be gone out with every form of, of, of communication with the public, no matter what it is. Because if this was another, any other place, that would have been done. And I think that's got to get out there that the farm is the most important <coughs> work. And we need all the help we can to keep the accidents down to uh, completely down. That's very good. So I'd like to see your stuff going out in every form, mm -hmm. every communication coming out of agriculture department, and then we can work on all the departments as well. Okay, we'll take that on board, Oliver. Uh, Thank you very and, much. And, Thank you. I, w I wish you well on all the support you can get. You'll get it up. I'm sure this committee. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Just a, thanks, Chair. Just a, a small one here. Um, you know, based on the information that you've had, you know, you said you've done videos there with families in the aftermath of deaths and injuries and all of that, right? And based on that information and the talking to families and that there, did the accidents, the deaths, the serious injuries or any injuries for that matter occur by the took the chance type attitude or was it one of those or you know, you can accidents are accidents but they're or some of them are, are based on, you know, he took the chance or she took the chance to do this. Another one is based on, you know, you're too big of a rush and you're rushing about and just getting into it, you know. So have you any studies done like that, you know, because I think if you did that, right, you probably have done it, right, because you're, you're into that, then, you know, you could hone in on a particular aspect of how you would tackle it, you know. Yeah, well, certainly all, all the fatal accidents are investigated and we look at, at not only the immediate causes, but if there's any underlying causes. Unfortunately, sometimes the only person who knows the yeah, well, motivation right, yeah. is unfortunately the person who has died. Mm -hmm. We also look at, at all other sorts of incidents. And in talking to farmers, yes, people will say to us that it was, I took a chance. Uh, people will say, I never realised it could happen. And that's another common one. And we've, we've maybe covered that. Actually, what they're saying is they, they knew fine well it could happen. It's just they didn't think it would happen that day at that time. <laughs> Because I think we're all aware of what the key issues are, and there's nothing that is causing fatalities that is coming out of the blue and we haven't seen before. Um, and a third one, people say, like, I was pressed for time, so I just decided I would go ahead and do something and say to us, in hindsight, it wasn't the right decision to make. And part of what we have to do is try and encourage a, an appropriate understanding of the, the risks and when you take shortcuts when it's appropriate. And there are times it's appropriate. You can take shortcuts and the implications are not going to be serious. There are other times yeah. when it's all too Absolutely. dangerous. I think the, the core of it is, you know, stop and think farm safe. You know, right. just that's, stop and yeah, think. That's right. And that's all we're after. Split second could save your life or yeah. serious injury. OK, thanks. OK. John, you want to leave Just a very quick, when you mentioned about um, awareness in the primary schools, but I think particularly teenagers, and may I say particularly teenager, teenage boys, need, need a lot of work in that area. I'm thinking particularly of the sort of uh, agricultural courses that are run, run in conjunction with our colleges mm -hmm. and sort of post-GCSE and that type of stuff. Is farm safety an integral part mm -hmm. of those courses? Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. At all the colleges, farm safety is an integral part. Uh, HSE and I have worked with DARD and the colleges in the syllabus. We provide speakers. Um, we have run specialist days along with the foundation. 
Also in the GCSE on agriculture and land management, health and safety is now on the curriculum as part of that course. So health and safety is considered part of that and in fact is one of the areas that can be used as for, for project or coursework. So there are a number of routes in. And then again at that group between primary school and, and, and um, further education, yeah. the young farmers clearly have a huge role to play there and they have such a good presence and footprint within um, the sector that they're seen as a key area to continue working. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everyone. Uh, certainly, uh, I commend you for the work you're doing. I think, I suppose, like everyone else, is more needs to be done. I mean, there's still people, uh, I suppose it's inevitable that it's difficult to totally stop all accidents, but uh, every effort needs to be done. And I did see in that campaign where 96% of farmers seen the campaign, so that's interesting at all. You can't wish to get much higher than that, that's almost 100%. Most so, uh, that was very, very good. Trying so. to find the 4% that didn't. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> maybe I have no TV, maybe there's no radio. <laughs> I think, Chair, with, with respect to the, the adverts, the reason why the adverts are actually so effective is that most people, they resonate with most, most people worth working and living on farms. Most people can put themselves in that situation at some time or other. I think that that's the, the the power in these adverts. Yes, because they can relate it to themselves. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Again, keep up the good work. Thank you Thanks very, very much, much indeed. Thank you, Thank you very much. much Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate your support. Appreciate your help. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Six are all briefing from Dorda Beef Sector and Circular Car Industry. Confirm members of the Clerk's Memo on pages 93 to 94. An overview paper provided uh, by Research Officer on page 95 to 101. And papers from the Department on pages 102 to 109. I understand the Department has also provided some of these papers in hard copy, which are being handed out. Right. Can you welcome Stephen Johnson, Food Policy, Jim Freeborn. Agriculture Inspector Beef and the Deep mm -hmm. Development. Um, <coughs> per Perpetua, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Megan E, Veterinary Service, story of a heaven. And Elaine McCory, uh, Food uh, Agency UK. Okay. You're all very, very welcome. And just ask you to do your presentation. And, uh, the main Thank you, Chair. And I'm actually going to lead off. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to update you on issues facing the beef and sucker cow industry. I'm Elaine McCrory, I'm Assistant Director for Agri-Food Policy in Dard, and I have with me Stephen Johnson, Food Policy, Jim Freeburn, Head of Dard Beef and Sheep Development at Caffrey, and Perpetua McNamee, Deputy Chief Veterinary Officer. I'd like to start by addressing some of the issues facing the beef sector, including the drop in beef prices and then providing some detail on the action taken by the Minister and the Department to assist the sector. Hopefully you'll all have received a copy of our briefing paper. And Chair, if I may, I would like to briefly highlight a number of matters in the paper. Turning first of all to beef prices, the beef sector here obviously plays a very important role in the Northern Ireland economy. In 2015, it accounted for 23% of gross farm output and 53% of farm employment. In 2015-16, net farm incomes in the sector ranged from 13 to 14,000 pounds. As a department, we've been acutely aware of the difficulties facing the beef industry over the last two years, with falling prices and low profits. These issues have been further compounded by the changes in labelling and the penalties imposed for out-of-spec animals. So there are clearly challenges. We are also very much aware that latest market reports show that Northern Ireland cattle prices are currently below 2014 and 2015 levels, and that there is a difference in the price paid 
for cattle in the north when compared to the price offered in Britain. As is pointed out in our paper, DART is working hard to help the sector become more efficient and profitable. This includes our determination to boost efficiency, sustainability and innovation <coughs> in the new rural development programme, help open up new markets and provide the necessary veterinary support to help the industry capitalise on those markets, enhance our penetration of existing markets by tackling labelling issues, and we're also committed to supporting education and R&D and facilitating better functioning supply chains. Looking to the future, prime cattle supplies are predicted to continue to tighten further across the, U the UK and ROI, which may offer some support to the market. An increased number of dairy cull cows were slaughtered in the second half of 2015, with this being linked to both a larger herd and the fall off in milk prices, resulting in a plentiful supply of manufacturing beef. Final results from the June 15 agricultural census show the beef cow numbers have recovered by 2% compared to 2014. However, farm businesses continue to lose money on animals sold this year, with underlying problems still remaining within the supply chain and further cash flow difficulties seem inevitable. The 2013 LMC study, which examined the beef price differential, identified transport costs to Britain, cheaper supply available from the south and seasonality of production, usually with an oversupply in the autumn, as the main causes of this differential. However, we're very much aware of the concerns about this differential and we're happy to explore what further can be done to improve the situation, bearing in mind DAR does not set the prices. However, we're continuing, all, continuing to do all we can to help the beef sector become more efficient, sustainable and profitable. Members will be aware the Department is currently consulting on coupled support in the beef and sheep sector. I understand that DARD colleagues briefed the committee a couple of weeks ago and the consultation is due to end in April and would very much welcome, obviously, um, good engagement from industry on that. Turning to the RDP, <coughs> the Farm Business Improvement Scheme will, subject to business case approval, include, include a portfolio of measures to support sustainable growth in the sector, including measures aimed at knowledge transfer, cooperation, innovation, capital investment. The first phase of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, knowledge transfer, opened for applications in November with the business development groups. And I'm pleased to say over 3,200 farmers have signed up to engage in these groups. The FBIS knowledge transfer component will also deliver farm family key skills training, including animal health, farm safety and business planning. The FBIS cooperation innovation components will include a range of schemes designed at supporting the development and transfer of new innovative ideas through collaboration to improve competitiveness, growth and development of the agri-food industry. And the capital scheme will then follow on in due course. At this stage, I would like to take a wee pause and invite Jim Freeburn to tell you more about the business development groups. OK, thank you. Um, I, I'm Jim Freeburn. I'm, I'm Beef and Sheep Development, uh, Head of Beef and Sheep Development and CAFRI. Um, we have been responsible for trying to set up these uh, beef development groups um, within this rural development programme. Uh, as Elaine had said, there were over uh, 3,200 applications, um, of which there were um, 1,762 that were associated with beef and sheep. Um, and this has been a, a great number uh, associated with this enterprise and these enterprises. Um, we are currently in the position of trying to get them formed into groups and as we speak there are letters going out inviting them for registration next week. Uh, we have managed to do so. Now I, I do have some charts and I'm not sure if it's possible to hand them out to you to show the, the makeup of where these groups are located. Um, if possibly you can ask. Um, just to say that we, we've done a number of things. We've split them into enterprises such as suckler beef, beef finishers and sheep. Um, and of that, there are 41 chocolate groups. Um, there are 13 beef finishers and 21 um, sheep groups. Um, you have in front of you um, 
a detail of where they're located. The, the, indi the individual colours in refer to a particular group. We've tried to keep them in a fairly tight geographical location. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to meet eight times a year. Uh, they're going to go around each other's farms. They're going to share information. Um, and we, they will have a, each will have a facilitator that will actually help to try and address issues that they want to discuss. And now, the beauty of this is what we want to do from this is to get farmers to talk, to share ideas and opinions, to help improve themselves. Right? Um, and this concept has been, uh, Chuggestown South did the, the Beef Technology Adoption Programme. <coughs> uh, they had that for the last four years. We are using a rural development programme to do the same here. Um, this time round, we also have put a linkage with some of the, the people when they applied said they had linkages with uh, meat plants. And what we've done is we've tried to look at some of the groups having an integrated supply chain linkage uh, because we knew that that was part of that going for growth. There is another document here which I, I would like you to see as well, and it's really through the work that we do in Caffrey through the auspice of the Irish Farmers Journal and ABP and ourselves in Caffrey. It's called the Northern Ireland Sucker Beef Programme. And if somebody could hand that out, it's, it just gives you some details of um, the, the results. We've had a, a number of farmers on the uh, various phases of it. Um, we now have got, uh, first phase and second phase people. Um, and just to say, the improvements that people have made, uh, you see by the little graph in the middle of it, um, the detail of uh, how the improvement has been made over the, the last. The first group has run for, this is now into their fifth year. The second phase are really only into their second year. And you see that each of them have all made improvements. And now, why has that been? And even compared to the CAFRI benchmark average, they're still making improvements. And that's part of the reason for that is that they come onto each other's farms, they sit and discuss, they look at best practices, they look at what's good for themselves, and they try to encourage each other. And we feel that this is the avenue that's going to take us forward under these uh, business development groups that have been formed. And here we have a real live example of improvements that can be made. Um, so we feel that through getting people to come together to discuss common issues in a, in a probably a, a very common setting, because um, the locality will remain the same, the same type of conditions will be there, that there is great opportunity for people to improve themselves. Also within CAFRI, uh, we are involved in benchmarking. We have 430 to, to 450 uh, farmers each year that benchmark. Um, gives us uh, results for approximately 750 enterprises each year. Um, and what we see from that is that from the... Um, top 25% to the bottom 25%, there is such a range in performance. And what we're seeing, and if you take the, the beef suckler cows um, and take them through to finishing, there's a difference between the top 25% to the bottom 25 of about 450 pounds a cow. Now that's a difference that people at the lower end through improvement can, could actually narrow that shortfall. And certainly, once again, going back to that Northern Ireland Sucker Beef Programme that I've highlighted there, that is ways in which people can actually make those improvements. And we see that there is an opportunity for farmers to make a difference in themselves through exploring what is going on, needing to provide information as to what's happening on their individual farms, but also too, to explore ways in which they can do things better. One of the things that we have also too is the fact that they're coming together in groups is that there is that support within the, uh, each other and they can help each other along and farmers are actually very good at supporting each other. Uh, and we feel that this is a, um, a, a great opportunity. Now, this is only really kicking off. Next week is really the registration events, um, but we're very hopeful that this will actually make and be seen to make such a difference on beef and sheep farms. Okay. Okay. If I just pick up on a couple of other areas now where the department is, is helping the sector. First of all, on beef exports, um, 
that opportunity, the, the opportunity to export to the US, has arisen for us at the same time as all other member states due to the lifting of the BSE ban in March 2014. And our industry has advised their main interest is in exporting beef trim, which would not be permitted actually under the South's approval that they have. DEFRA has contacted the UF's authorities to stress that we want approval to export all beef, including trim, as the outcome of our inspection. And officials are working with industry and the Food Standards Agency to put in place arrangements for the testing required to permit this. Also, the DEFRA Secretary of State intends to visit the US in mid-April, where it is hoped that a date for the red meat inspection will be secured. And as um, the committee may be aware, the Canadian market has also recently opened. Now, I'm sure Perpetua would be happy to talk you through more detail of the process of accessing new markets, if that's what the committee would like. And she'll also be able to field any questions around exports and animal health. In closing, I just want to draw attention to, to three points made in regard to animal health in our paper. First of all, the TB Strategic Partnership Group was established to provide the Minister with a strategy and implementation action plan to effect a progressive and sustained reduction in both the level of TB and the cost of the eradication programme. And as you'll be aware, the Minister announced yesterday that the TBSG has requested more time to submit its strategy and action plan, and she's expecting a further update uh, next month. Secondly, the Department has obtained officially brucellosis free status from the European Commission in October, and this has significantly reduced by over 50% the compliance cost to farmers, which in recent years was some £7 million per year. Finally, DORD has worked closely with the industry through Animal Health and Welfare in Northern Ireland to develop a BVD tag and test scheme. It is supported by new legislation coming into effect today and will be implemented operationally by Awani using industry-generated funding. In conclusion, I think it's clear there are very big challenges for the beef sector, but the department working under Minister O'Neill is making long strides to help the industry reach its potential. We'd be very happy to take the committee's questions or elaborate on any of the points covered, and I'll try to direct you to the most appropriate colleague for that. OK, thank you very much. We're told that we have the fourth, fourth highest beef price in the EU. Uh, what are the main reasons that the sector can be? And we're told we have the fourth, fourth highest beef price, but still the sector can't be profitable. What are the main reasons for that, do you believe? The Beef Brit Price Differential Report um, was conducted in 2013, and as I said, it, it identified a number of reasons, including transport costs, seasonality of production. Third one, I can't remember right now. But so there were a number of, of reasons. Um, I think it was also cheaper beef coming from the south. Um, there were a number of recommendations made at that time. Now we have recently met with the UFU to talk about the report again, and we're happy to have another look to see where we've actually got to on making progress with some of those recommendations. Um, there are a combination of recommendations for industry, recommendations for industry and government, and there's one for ourselves, I think, around um, movement restrictions. And we imagine that that will be examined uh, in the course of the work on of the TBSG. But as I say, we're, we're happy to, to take a fresh look at that report again to see what further progress can be made. I do see uh, in response from the Department that there's £384 million pounds of meat imported into Northern Ireland uh, per year. Uh, so this surely plays a big part in keeping prices down. I'm not sure what the exact percentage of meat imported compared to uh, locally produced meat is. I, I think it's, it's relatively small, but I, I'm happy to clarify that for the committee. Okay. Obviously, if For the figure we have is 384 million. Yeah. yeah it's, an, it's an yeah. HMRC figure. Yeah, it's a, um, um, obviously if there's oversupply, that that will depress prices. Um, I think supply has also increased locally, and we are hearing that that there is um, quite a lot of manufacturing beef. In <coughs> so that that will depress prices, but as I said, we're we're happy to look to see if there is something practical that we can do to help with the beef price differential. Okay, Sean, Sean, thanks, Sean. thanks, and thank you very much for your, for your presentation. I found it useful. And just following on from that point of the chairs there, 
and that point eight, um, it's, you say somewhere that prime cattle supplies are expected to tighten in Britain and, and in the Republic of Ireland. What is the situation in terms of in Europe? Yeah. I don't have those figures to hand at the moment. Um, I, I do think there is still oversupply in Europe, but I'd certainly be happy to, to clarify that. Okay. You did mention too about tackling labelling issues. And these things seem to come around. I suppose if you're sceptical about it, it seems to be a way of keeping farmers' prices down, particularly when we talk about nomads and so on in the past. What progress has been made on that? We have had quite a lot of engagement with the South on this. We've, there's also been engagement with retailers on it. The Minister has written to Commissioner Hogan about the matter, and she's also written to Liz Truss. Now, both Commissioner Hogan and Liz Truss are supportive about finding a, a, a solution. Uh, it would be an additional voluntary label. Now, it will not, be, will not change the mandatory label. Um, so they, they are supportive, and the Minister is continuing to engage, or has been continuing to engage, with Minister Coveney on the issue. So what we need is for Mr Coveney to um, agree with us a, a suitable voluntary label. And one of the labels we are looking at is the use of an all um, Island of Ireland label, which would make it clear that um, the animal has... Or the meat comes from an animal that has been born, reared, and slaughtered on this island. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, do on. Top. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I thank you for your briefing and declare an interest in my husband to be a farmer, and in fact, he's in this programme as well. <laughs> um, so uh, I know that in Northern Ireland we do produce that world beating quality beef. Um, can you give us an update? It's probably for that you need to address um, on the trade agreement with Canada. And I notice in your brief the progress in accessing the USA beef market for export. Could you update us on that progress as well? Um, with respect to Canada, um, the, um, the export health certificate was agreed through um, EU channels, so it's agreed at EU level. Um, however, Northern Ireland and um, were the first region of the UK to access that certificate, and um, the the product is moving and has been moving from um, late December, early January. Um, so we're we're very pleased that we've been able to access that market. Um, the in the US situation, um, the industry have stated that access to the US market, particularly for um, beef intended for grinding or sometimes called trim, um, is a priority for them. Um, so they have expressed their interest. However, there are some barriers in the sense that the microbiological standards that must be attained um, are, are quite stringent. Um, as Elaine mentioned in her briefing, the South of Ireland have taken a two-step approach. They have gone for prime cuts, where the, the standards are not as stringent as they would be for the trim or the beef intended for grinding. We have taken um, an approach where we, we would like to go for both. So at this stage, we are awaiting um, advice from the FSA. The FSA have gone to Europe. And at this stage, it looks as if the FSA are going to give us some feedback about mid-March. Mid-March. Mid -March. We will then proceed um, with validation of baseline testing for these microbiological criteria. We'll then review the situation to see where we are at that stage. We'll come back to the industry and take their view on how they would like us to proceed. So that's one aspect of it. In terms of the process itself, which generally starts off with completion of a very detailed questionnaire. The questionnaire should be it's in its third iteration now. We have had to do quite a number of clarifications with the US Department of Agriculture, and we expect that to be going back in its final stage in roughly a week or two. So we're far advanced in terms of the documentation that needs to be put in place. Um, once the validation and the FSA criteria are in place, and if the industry decides to continue to prioritise this, we will then invite the US to come and carry out an inspection. So we would, at this stage, we're looking towards the second half of 2016, if, with a fair wind, yes.
Can you give us your assessment on the impact on the Russian import ban on local beef sector? Well, from our point of view, um, we monitor the volumes um, of exports, which is where my um, area of expertise lies. And obviously the Russian import ban, which again is a certificate agreed through EU channels, um, since the imposition of the ban, it certainly has um, affected the volume. It has also um, meant that industry therefore need to focus on other markets. We meet with industry on a quarterly basis in the north. Uh, we discuss three key objectives, their priorities, the barriers and their contingencies. And one thing that we stress at all times, because obviously this is a very commercial situation, is that they should have contingency markets in place for when it, issues happen and markets close. So certainly there's been an impact mm -hmm. and we, as I say, continue to stress to industry that they need to have contingency in, in place. There are currently 64 beef markets open to the industry. There are currently 17 in use. So again, we continue to stress to the industry to make use of those markets once they are open. Third countries have um, maintained quite a lot of resource in negotiation of market access, and they like to see that markets are used once they're opened. So we would stress this. So 17 out of 64? Yes. So obviously um, trade agreements go both ways. Yeah. And I know that concern has been raised with me around the importation of US beef products into Northern Ireland under the current hormone treatment in the US. Um, am I correct that the majority of their beef products would not be accepted under EU rules on hormone treatment? Well, as, as far as, my, as, as I am aware, that's a red line issue for the EU, yeah. So it wouldn't be? No. Okay. Because farmers raise with me quite often um, the importation of beef from South America into Northern Ireland. So, uh, and are you aware if hormone treatment is a feature in these countries? And if it is, are beef products checked for hormone treatment when they arrive into Northern Ireland? I would have to get back to you on that. I'm not. I, Could you I please? Would, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that is an issue that, that yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, because of the complete ban on hormone treatment in the, in the EU, if any of our farmers were caught using it, there would be stringent penalties on them. In fact, they wouldn't probably be able to ever trade again. Are you aware of any beef products imported into Northern Ireland being found to contain hormones? I'm not aware of that. I am aware of the, um, the National Residues Con Control Plan, which we implement as, um, as a competent authority here in Northern Ireland. And um, the incidence of um, certainly there would be implications for any farmer if there were residues positive found um, in animals. In, in importations? Well, these are, these are homebred animals. Um, we don't um, test imported me for no. Right, it's just our farmers jump through so many hoops and rightly so to produce world quality, but yet, and uh, as you've outlined to export, the certificates and all the details they have to go through to export, yet I'm quite concerned from information I'm getting that the same stringent penalties regards hormones aren't in importation, so you're saying they're not, you're, they're not tested? Um, it's, n it's not part of the official controls that we in DARD um, uh, have governance of. I can check for you whether or not it's, it's applied by any other regulatory authority. So Would you please? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oliver. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, the, the, the whole thing about the um, nomadic cattle, etc., and uh, we, were, we were talking to all these people in Europe and all, and we've done all that. Part of that problem is the meat plants, who, in a, and it's a while they held uh, agreement that they control prices. And there's nothing being done about that, or can there be anything done about that? 
or is that just market volatility? Because from what I, my part of uh, looking at it, we're the only region in Europe that has us double labelling. We are the only region, and it could be it could be looked at at at, at, this, um, at barrier to trade in a way. And, I, and I'm surprised that hasn't been brought up anywhere at all in any of the arguments on this double labelling. We just seem to take it for granted this double labelling because of the, the European criteria for the, for the cattle born in the country, slaughtered in another country, etc. But it doesn't seem to happen in any other part of Europe. I think issues probably have been raised about it before, but not, on, not to the same extent as there would be here. Um, Certainly what we're hearing in terms of processors at the time when we had major problems in 2014, the processors were saying that they were applying retailer specifications and, and that is why they were insisting on single origin cattle or meat from single origin. Um, certainly what we are trying to do though is to increase transparency in the supply chain through, for example, the supply chain form so that, that farmers are clearer on what it is they're being asked to produce and that they have adequate time then to adjust um, so that they're not left with animals that, that are going to be out of spec and that they're going to get penalties for. So we are trying to in increase that transparency within the, play in the supply chain and to get all elements of the supply chain working together. And as I said earlier, we have spoken to the retailers about this as well. What's their view on it? Retailers, um, it's quite, um, it can be difficult to get them to the table, but we are seeing them getting more engaged and we are outlining the problems and they are um, becoming engaged in the supply chain forum, which is good to see. And we've got some very positive signals from them that they will continue to do that. And as I said, I think it's important that we do encourage all elements of the chain to continue to work together. I suppose another struggle <coughs> of that is um, looking at if there are unfair trading practices there, then we need to be able to do something about that. And I'm sure you're aware the Minister has been very um, strong before on the grocery code adjudicator and her role in making sure that there's fairness in the supply chain. Um, I would also like to update the committee on the fact that the, the European Commission did publish a report recently on unfair trading practices. And we, we have been putting back comments on that to try and in, encourage the Commission to do more in well, this area. On that fair trading, have we looked into the, any other part of Europe that has the same um, control as we have here on la the double labelling of beef? We have certainly asked about it, but whilst there are general comments, nobody is flagging up specific No, no, not, not, asking, about, not asking or flagging up. Is there any other part of Europe that has this control that we have? I couldn't say categorically that, that they have the same issue as yeah, we have. That's the point I'm making. And because we share the land border. And that is the thing that's missing out of all of the arguments about to take this double labelling forward. If we are the only place in Europe that has this, then there is there could be an argument. I'm not saying there is an argument. There could be an argument for unfair or not unfair practice, unfair trading. You know, because you have you have the thing in Europe where they, they, they have a European thing, they look at the trading in islands. That should be something that should be looked at here as well. We, we've, we've certainly flagged the issue that, that we probably are one of the few, if not the only, um, region that shares a land board with another member state, and this causes <coughs> right, problems, and we continue to raise that. But we haven't got that. We don't raise that as, as the reason. It's one of the reasons here. We don't, we don't use that argument. I've never heard that argument been used. Well, it's, it's certainly something we've flagged mm -hmm. to DEFRA and to... And it's for the meat sure. plants. The same meat plants that you're talking here are the same meat plants in England. You know, if, we, if we're £90, pound, £100 pound ahead less in England for the beef that's getting imported, exported to England, the same meat plants. It's the same market. Yeah, certainly the case that, that, that they do have the same mm. plants in different 
different regions. And as I said earlier, you know, we're happy to go back and look at the beef differential yes. report again and see is there something further we can do around that. And the fact is we're the, we are the only one with a land border. Now what would happen there if we came out of Europe? I don't know. <laughs> is the answer to that? <laughs> There's lots of things I don't know would happen if we came out of Europe. I would have a second. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we, if we are going forward with our our our, 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 our markets and all the rest, but I would not affect our market. Well, in terms of certification, in, but in terms of resource resourcing the process, um, if I could. Maybe talk you through the process just as um, we agree our priorities, we then agree them on a UK basis. Um, most of the certificates that I mentioned are bilateral certificates agreed on a UK basis. A very small number agreed to the EU. So if we if we came out of Europe, that would mean we would be a non obviously a non EU country. We would become a third country. And we would either then negotiate, renegotiate them all again on a bilateral yeah. basis, um, or we would go through um, the EU channel, the Potsdam Group channel. Now, either way, that would carry a very high overhead in terms of resource and administration and time and complexity. And um, it's. Cost. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it would take time. Mm -hmm. It would. Um, there would certainly be um, delays in the process. It's a complicated process anyway. Mm -hmm. So we would have to look very closely at how this would happen if that situation arose. Um, I think it's something we should be looking at. If that, if that debate's on at the minute, prior to June, then I think it's something we should be looking at. You know the two scenarios out there, either we, uh, if we stay in or go out, you know, because that, that is certainly going to come up again, and the volatility of the market and how the market will be if it did say to come out, you know, um, and the argument we're having at the minute whilst we're in, what worse if we come out? Um, yeah. I, I, know, I, I, know the, I know the Minister has yes. a lot of concerns around yes. that. And I was worried too about the the the, the, uh, the grocery code adjudicator whilst they do some things. I think this thing, Dublin label thing, not being looked at here in the fair place that we're getting here. For the I think they're only tinkering around the edges on. Okay, all right. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Sydney Anderson. Right, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, can I touch on the other DART support for the for the beef sector here? I'm looking at some of the figures in paragraph 32 that the DART support uh, in education, training, research, and such like, uh, and advice and guidance give to farm businesses. Uh, you tell us there's 2,445 trainees that attended technical training events. Yes, um, last year. Yeah. 1481 were beef trainees, 547 sheep trainees, right? Uh, that, that was in addition to those numbers then we had this, uh, the Agriculture Business Operations course, the Level 2 qualification, so we mm. trained the, that 1,400 and then the 500 and they were in addition do to all, that. Do all the ones who, who enter the course, Jim, do the complete or is there much of a fallout here? Um, very little of a fallout. Um, of the ones that entered, um, if we Realistically, last year there were three and a half thousand people applied, uh, of which two thousand six hundred went forward to uh, registering and enrolling on the course. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, some pulled out because of poor attendance on the rest. But we had a fairly good retention rate in that we ended up with two thousand four hundred and fifty-four. I think was the exact number that actually got an award. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Uh, and it so coincided last year that we also had a, an ETI inspection, same as the schools get, because we provide a education function. Um, and that was one of the things that they were very complimentary about mm. in that our retention of students. Um, and it was a, a very worthwhile exercise. And, and in fairness, this was something that um, we had, these people, the average age was 28 years old. Mm. 
and you know, and they're all uh, and came, and this was the first real opportunity that they got back into the science of what is agriculture, um, and, and it was very, very worthwhile, I have to say. Now that's encouraging, and I say that's good. Uh, the, the point is good to hear that the retention rate was that the interest was still there. That yeah. sometimes you get these enrolments and they could uh, so so drop off as the, 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 the course goes on. They just maybe would not complete. But it's interesting that the, the, the majority of them did go to the oh, no, they they level. Um, great, like as a ninety plus percent. You know. Uh, well, that, that, that's good. Um, can I just ask about um, the different? Uh, Increases in the uh, the phase one farms, the phase two farms per hectare, the five fifty seven and the six forty five, uh, and that management planning that the farms are going forward with. How do you see that going in, into the future? Can that be improved on to? Yeah, the better, what we can find from, of, from our benchmarking results. Mm. Um, as I said, we have 434 50 on average mm -hmm. a year. And they increase now with these business development groups because mm -hmm. we're expecting more of them to benchmark. Mm -hmm. um, what we tend to find is that the top 25% improve themselves year on year. The bottom 25% tend to go the opposite way. They get worse. Right? Why is that? I don't know. They don't, uh, you know, they're, they're given the same sort of guidance and advice. They, they tend to think, oh, and I think a lot of it's to do with, oh, I can't do anything, oh, you know, and they just lack that confidence to, to go out and go off and do push things. Push on, yeah. And push on. Whereas yeah. I think through, and, and that's because they work with us on a one-to-one -one basis, <coughs> I think this idea of working as a group, you will then end up with our participating farmers t taking them aside and saying, you know, for example, a lot of it's down to improving grassland production and the utilisation of grass. And they'll say, I'll help you set up a paddock system, or I'll do this. And we see a lot of that probably kicking in in the future. And it's really where the industry takes some degree of responsibility and helps themselves, you know, you know, really looking after each other. And there is that relationship. It's going to take a period of time. We're setting up these new groups. They're only coming in for registration from next week on. It's going to take a period of time for them to get familiar with each other and, and build that up. But in the long term, I reckon it has the potential to make a, an amazing difference. When you say that, now, what are we talking about in years and what, what are we saying? No, um, you take a look at the, even the stuff that we've highlighted there in the Northern Ireland Sector Beef Programme. The first phase farmers started in 2011. Right. Right. They're now into, what is this, the fourth, fifth year. Look at the improvement they have made from yeah. that. So within a matter of two, three years, we will see you will you should be able to see a, a great improvement. You talked about some someone's maybe these, what you're telling us that these groups will maybe those who are the more successful ones and who are keen to push on will encourage others who are need not so much help that will yeah. encourage them to. Well, you tend to um, even in, in trying to formulate this group, we, we did meet with Chuggis last year just to say right, well, you know. Within a group, they had their group size was in the region of 15 to 20 people, and they said within that 20 people there were five who basically didn't really embrace. There were five that were go-getters, and there was uh, then the remainder were in between. Between you yeah. trying to encourage them, yeah. and I, and I don't think we'll be any different. So even though you're in a group, there'll be some who embrace it and go with it, and there'll be some who don't. Now, in fairness. Part of this is that we need to show a measure of improvement. If they are not improving, now, and this is for uh, down the road in two to three years' time, <coughs> when it comes to 2017 and we're looking at a review of this, if not made any difference, we will be asking you to leave and really looking at an opportunity for those that were unfortunate not to be able then to be in it this time round should come in. And leave I think that, that's only but yeah, fair. Yeah, leave that opportunity for someone else, that's what you're telling us. Yes. Yeah, if, if they don't embrace. No, I, I do appreciate the, the effort you're making. In that particular role, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy, but uh, if one can give them courage to others and push on, yes. and hopefully that, that may be key to some of the, the plans you have for the future in this area. I, I, and I appreciate this time, you know, a lot of, you know, it is a very lonely profession. Mm -hmm. You can get isolated in your own area and you can think, oh, this is, and I can't make ends meet. Yeah. And I think all we need to do all of us is to give encouragement is to say that this is possible now it's not going to happen overnight but by making these small steps forward 
I think we can move an industry into giant leaps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, in regard to the suckler herd, uh, part of the difficulty is I see it as a farmer myself. Uh, with average herd, say 16. Yep. I think another there, which is yep. uh, small. The average herd is 16. Yeah, average herd size. But you have a lot of producers that, when you look at, and then the figures there, they were given that the farms that were um, greater than 30 cows. Um, that's 15% of the farmers. 15% of the farmers have 50% of the cows. Yeah. Right? So let's get it in context. While the average is small, there are a lot of people with small herds, but by the same token, we have a lot of people with and not 30 plus. And, and I think they're the ones that we... Now, when we were forming these groups, size hasn't come into it. We have a range of people in here, all inclusive. Yep. Um, and in fairness, I think that's good because we've got a whole profile of smaller farmers and larger farmers all together in the one mix. And I think that's good. Um, yep. Because it, even if you're a part-time farmer, you probably have to be fairly technically efficient to get out in the morning to get to your job, right? Well, if, if, size if, if, if they're not efficient to be safe without the cows, because they're going to keep the cows very quickly. If not <laughs> <laughs> so as I see it, you know. Yeah. So I think it's very important that they... But some of those, that's probably the difficulty, is getting those part-time ones motivated to make sure that they do it fairly well too, because uh, suckler cows is one thing that could be very expensive, is it not? Look after properly. They can be, but uh, you know, going back to our experience last year on the level two, yeah. uh, a lot of these guys, um, you know, from um, small family farms. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I know that. The, the number of builders vans that we had parked in the campuses was uh, living testimony to that. But like great, dedicated young people, I have to say. Yeah. You know, to carry out a, a job like that and then go home in the evening to do, you know, that's a big commitment. And they were very interested in how could I make this job easier, simpler, more efficient. And, and there was a great uptake, you know. And I, I think give encouragement to you know to the younger people. It's really good. Well, it's good to see them with an interest and in, in wanting to do that. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I'm aware of some other one that actually works from on my own farm, and he keeps suckler cows for yeah. me. So he does it before he comes in the morning. I have to go home at night. So. Yes. Um, we export to, uh, I think I'm read here somewhere, 64 different countries. What percentage of our exports go to the mainland Britain? Do you know? Anyone know that? What percentage by, of our exports actually? By volume or by value? By, by value um, the well, and the. Yeah, by yeah, value or tonnage, yeah. really, either um, you know, well, just, by, just curious to know yeah. back, what volume um, goes to the UK market. Of beef? I mean, beef. Uh, the, the last set of official statistics that, that we have um, are the group. beef and sheep group. collectively, and to GB, 65% of our exports. By value, yeah. Of our exports. Okay. We do not have any beef finished because that's oh, what um, I Well, I mean, therefore, the right. biggest okay. share is sheep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. sheep yeah. one. Yeah. That's yeah. sheep. Yeah. Um, right. Dan, listen, can I thank you very much for coming along? Sorry. Just, sorry. just one small one. Do you see the grassland management as a, as, a, as a key factor here? Because, you know, if you look at some of the figures you gave us there, there's 60 or 70 percent of their beef or sheep enterprises are coming from the old NFA areas. Yes, OK. And then it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, sometimes you think, you know, you look generally, you know, that from the the milk people have been very good at being more efficient about growing grass and having high quality grass. Yep. So we're up against it when yeah. we quite a bit of it's in LFA? No. Um, we are fortunate enough to have our Glenwarry Hill farm as well. So that's a good demonstration event. Uh, and certainly what we have, you know, okay, our stocking rate is much less. Yeah. Right? But at the same degree, you can have these cows and they calve down at the same, you know, in a, in a very, you know, we're trying to keep a calving index of 365 days. We have 100 cows on that unit. We have a th uh, 1,100 ewes, right? Um, but the same principles apply to utilising the vegetation. Now, it's not luscious grass, but, you know, there's, the, and the whole principle of, you know, caring for the environment. The environment comes into a big issue in the like of those upland areas. 
um, and also to make a utilisation of the, the vegetation that does exist. And, and um, you know, there are issues to do with rush control and all the rest. And, Try to make sure that the, the vegetation is capable and you have the right type of stock on that ground. So there's a lot you can do to enhance the production from that area. I know it's different to the lowland, but the same principles by and large still exist. Okay. Okay. That was it. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Okay. Right. I'm trying to phrase it. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. A Oh, they're on a minute. Oh, they're finished. Aye, right, aye. No, we're, we're on the process of trying to get those um, yeah. all marked all and get it all done so they can get their um, certificates. Uh, and go for a minute. Oh, aye, yes, I think we did, yes. No more presentations. You just said it the base is on there, the base is on there, and just got all the story. Nice to meet you. Thank 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 then they debate with a written briefing to order and the Northern Ireland Poultry Health Assurance Scheme Fees Amendment Order to Northern Ireland 2016. Can refer members to the memo for the clerk at pages 158 and 159 and papers provided by the Department at pages 160 to 177. Can advise members that the Northern Ireland Poultry Health Assurance Scheme was introduced in 1989 and implemented a scheme of approval for establishments officially for establishments officially recognised as meeting the requirements of Council Directive 2009-158-EC. Uh, the scheme is therefore a prerequisite for farmers in Northern Ireland who wish to trade with other EU member states. Um, participants are required to pay to the Department to the Department fees relating to inspection and administrative costs associated with the operation of the scheme in order to comply with Treasury guidelines and government policy on full cost recovery. The hard plans to introduce new fees to the regulations for 2016-17 financial year. This is the first fee uplift since 2013. The proposed fees will be 250.51p for registration and first year membership, an increase of 20.16 pence on the existing charge and 28.83 for the annual membership fee, an increase of £3.35 on the existing charge. The rule will be laid before the Assembly on the negative resolution procedure, and it is anticipated that it will come into operation on April 2016. Can I seek comments from members? No comments. Can I seek agreement that the SL1 moves to the next legislative stage? Okay. okay. Agenda item 9, written briefing to ARD, the scrappy, scrappy Fees Amendment Regulations in Northern Ireland 2016. Can I refer members from the memo from the clerk at pages 179 to 180 and papers from, provided by the department at page 181 to 198. Can I advise members that the Scrapey mo Monitored Flux Scheme operates on a full cost recovery basis with participants required to pay an initial registration flock inspection fee and an annual membership flock audit fee. The fees have remained at the same level since April 2013. The existing legislation needs to be amended in order to allow the order to introduce a new fee schedule. This will enable the Department to fully recover costs of services provided in the 2015-16 financial year and ensure compliance with, the, with Treasury guidelines and DFP policy on full cost recovery. The revised fees will be £233.44p for initial flock inspection and £115.04p for subsequent annual membership increases. Uh, membership increases of 12.44% uh, and 23.17% respectively. The responses to a public consultation and the proposals reflected Thank concerns you. about the rate of increase. However, the Department countered that following a revision. Of the scheme. <coughs> the need for additional time spent in respect of administration has contributed to a rise in costs. The rule will be laid before the Assembly under the negative resolution procedure, and it is anticipated that it will come into operation in April 2016. Can I seek comments from members? Chair, it says, I was talking about the, the fees and 
just after the table that the fees said. It should be noted that these figures are for indicative purposes at this stage and the DARD will endeavour to keep charges as low as level as possible. So I presume by us approving it, we're not actually approving the exact amount. The exact amount. Therefore, I'm not sure I would be content to approve an amount that could potentially be higher than what it is they're asking us to, to do. So instead of being that you know, the rise is shown from the old fee to the proposed fee, it's actually a indicative proposed fee because it isn't actually the fee, that, or it may not, or because it is, un is unlikely to be the fee that they're actually going to charge. How, do you how, see how, how can we, you know, maybe it's just common language that they use, but it's not something I've noticed before. All right, Jared, get a response for it next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So we not on the other part. Okay. 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 We'll do the two correspondence and we'll find for the program here. Then we'll go back to we move back to agenda item seven. We have an oral briefing from Dard on public consultation on the Trip C framework and update on the committee review. Can I refer members to the clerk's memo at pages 111 and 113? Papers provided by the Department at pages 114 to 156. Can I welcome Colette McMaster, Centre of Policy, Al Heaney, Sustainable Rural Communities, Paul Donnelly, Rural Development West. You're all here. Very well. I was asked to do your presentation. You have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman, for the opportunity to make this presentation on the tackling rural poverty and social isolation, the TRIPSI mm. framework. Me now, eh? With me is Niall Heaney. Niall leads um, within DARD on policy on the TRIPSI framework, and Paul Donnelly leads on the delivery of the TRIPSI framework. In my opening comments, I'll cover first of all the proposals for a successor TRIPSI framework and the outcome of the public consultation and then I'll provide an update on the implementation of the recommendations made in the Yard Committee's position paper produced last year following the Committee's review of TRIPSI. As you'll be aware, the TRIPSI framework is one of a number of complementary rural initiatives led by DARD aimed at helping to ensure that the needs of rural communities are addressed. The TRIPSI framework aims to help tackle rural poverty and social isolation through statutory organisations working in partnership to design and implement measures that target the needs of vulnerable people in rural areas. In particular, TRIPSI promotes the development of new and innovative pro approaches to address rural issues. The existing TRIPSI framework 2011 to 2015 was the second rural anti-poverty and social isolation framework produced by DARD. It was built on the success of the previous framework, which ran from 2008 until 2011. The existing framework was originally scheduled to operate until March 2015, but it was subsequently extended by one year to March 2016 to take account of the revised budgetary period. The Department arranged for an evaluation of the existing TRIPC framework to be carried out by the Strategic Investment Board between April and July last year. The evaluation report on TRIPC identified a number of recommendations relevant to any successor framework. The evaluation report um, contained 18 recommendations which have informed the development of the successor framework. In particular, it recommended a greater focus on targeting the needs of rural dwellers, the establishment of a forum for discussing rural poverty and social isolation issues, and consideration being given to help ensure that successful TRIPSI projects are mainstreamed by government organisations. Moving now to the proposals for the successor TRIPSI framework. DARD's proposals, um, as I said, were informed by the draft evaluation report, also the Yard Committee's position paper, and informal consultations with key stakeholder organisations. I'll outline briefly the proposed key features for the new framework. The framework will maintain the three key priority areas for intervention that were supported in the existing TRIPSI framework, namely access poverty, financial poverty and social isolation. Flexibility of the framework and a focus on encouraging effective partnership working will, will continue to be key elements in the successor framework. In terms of key features that are new, 
The proposals for the new framework include new aims and objectives, a new set of key principles and a more flexible approach to the list of target groups. Importantly, there will be a greater focus on encouraging the development of new and innovative approaches, facilitating the piloting of new projects to test their viability, encouraging the mainstreaming of successful projects and supporting measures which lever additional funding or other resources which help to tackle rural poverty and social isolation. The proposals for the new framework also include the establishment of a forum to advise on poverty and social isolation issues in rural areas and the extension of the role of the DARD-led Interdepartmental Committee on Rural Policy, the IDCRP, to include rural poverty and social isolation. The consult consultation document setting out the proposals for the new framework also contained a draft action plan, which set out broad themes where support would be targeted under new TRIPSI framework and detailing the types of initiatives that may be supported under each theme. Public consultation on the proposals for a successor to the TRIPSI framework 2011-15 commenced on the 18th of November 2015 and ended on the 20th of January 2016. And during this nine-week period, the Department held a public consultation stakeholder event at Lockery Campus to inform stakeholders about the proposals and to provide an opportunity for stakeholders to discuss them and express their views. Around 50 people attended this event from a range of organisations, including local councils, the Housing Executive, the Rural Development Council, the Rural Community Network, Rural Support, the Rural Support Networks and representatives from other community organisations. The event provided the opportunity to highlight some of the successes of the existing TRIPSI framework, with presentations given by the Northern Health and Social Care Trust on the Farm Families Health Checks project, by the Advantage Foundation on the Boost programme, and by Libraries NI on the Health and Mind project. A total of 83 written responses to the public consultation were received from a wide range of organisations, the vast majority being from the voluntary community sector, about 72% of responses. Following the public consultation, the responses have been analysed within DARD and a report has been compiled which summarises the responses received and includes DARD's response to matters raised. And a copy of this report has been forwarded to the committee in advance of today's meeting. Consultation responses were overwhelmingly supportive of the Department's proposals for a successor framework, with many commenting on the positive impact that the current TRIPSI framework has had on the lives of vulnerable people in rural areas. Many highlighted the importance of partnership working, the flexibility of the framework and its focus on promoting new and innovative approaches to tackling rural poverty and social isolation. Taking account of the responses to the consultation and the final evaluation report now received on the existing TRIPSI framework, there will be no major changes made to the proposals that were issued for consultation. Some minor changes will be made to um, wording for the proposed aim, objectives and key principles, to reflect comments made in the consultation responses and to take account of the final report on the evaluation of the current TRIPSI framework, which was received during the consultation period. Moving to the next steps then, um, following the consultation process, currently work is underway within the Department to complete the new TRIPSI framework document. The intention is that the new framework will set the overarching policy and direction for the poverty and social isolation work led by the Department. It is envisaged that there will be a separate TRIPSI action plan and it is proposed that the action plan would be a flexible document that would be updated to address emerging rural needs that are identified and subject to the available funding. Moving now to the implementation schedule. And, um, the committee has requested an update on its inquiry into TRIPSI. DARD has forwarded a copy of its implementation schedule, which details progress on the recommendations contained in the committee's position paper published last year. You will note from the implementation schedule the progress that has been made in relation to each recommendation. We can confirm we are on track to meet the proposed time frame of 31 March 2016 for the completion of the new TRIPSI framework, as per recommendations 1, 2, 4 and 6b, and also that the research to assess the impact <coughs> of the proofing in relation to recommendation 3 has commenced on 1 October 2015. Thank you for your attention. We will be happy to take any questions regarding the proposals for the successor TRIPSI framework and the implementation schedule. And I will call on colleagues to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation.
Um, I understand that the evaluation of the MARA programme has now happened and has been approved. As you know, the committee felt that MARA was uh, an excellent project. What can you tell me about the evaluation of MARA and what are the main points that came out of that evaluation? Maybe Paul, Paul, Paul might be the best place to talk okay. about the evaluation of MARA. Thanks, Chair. Yes, um, it, uh, as you know, Chair, and uh, you commented on before, with the evaluation took, took, took place um, the, towards the end of last year. I suppose, in general, and, and no surprise, I mean, the evaluation was, was fairly positive of, of the work under the MARA scheme, um, both of their approach and, and, and the interdepartmental working, but also, more importantly, on, on the benefits um, to, to those householders and, and, and those who received the visit, ultimately, and, and some of the follow up referrals. I suppose there are a number of um, uh, recommendations that come out of that. I mean, it is uh, recommended that you know we you know, need to continue more close working with other government departments in relation to moving it forward. Um, we need to look at what refinements could be made to to the project to help to help uh, improve the benefits from others. But in, in the main, it was a positive evaluation. And I suppose it, it, it did. It does also make the point. I mean, a lot of work has been done. I mean, at, at, at the completion of this year, twenty-one thousand. Households will have been uh, visited ac across rural Northern Ireland, which is a substantial number of households, and indeed the most vulnerable households. So, um, I suppose uh, from the way forward, it is trying to see how we could mainstream some of the work on the Mara and, 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 and look at some of our other departments and what work they're doing, and how come some of the learning can be implemented there, and, and it has challenged us to sort of look at the, the longer term future of the project. Okay. Um what do you tell me about the Interdepartmental Committee on Rural Policy? How many times has it met in the last 12 months, and has it made any difference to the way in which rural issues are considered in other government departments? Well, um, I'll maybe start with this and then I'll come in on that. So the Interdepartmental um, Committee has um, an oversight role in relation to the Rural White Paper Action Plan in particular. I think that's the sort of main reason that it was established. It, it, it includes, it's led by DARD, um, and includes representatives from all of the departments. And um, the representatives really are the, um, those in those departments who are um, our contacts and coordinating um, people who deal with and report on the, um, the actions carried out by departments that they have committed to within the Rural White Paper Action Plan. Um, so um, we, have, we have recently, in fact, it was in December, we've published the, the last annual report on the Rural White Paper Action Plan. Um, we are proposing, we have proposals um, as in the TRIPC consultation, we propose to extend the um, remit of that committee to um, beyond Rural White Paper Action Plan specifically, to take in, um, to have a role um, in overseeing the, the TRIPC framework in the future. So um, maybe ask Niall if you, yeah. is there anything you want to add? To that. Although they haven't met within the past year, there is correspondence on every six monthly basis at least because they feed in, give us an update on their actions because we're in correspondence with them. Not every six months, every quarter as well. So they give us an update on what their contribution to the Rural White Paper Action Plan is. And as Clad said, we're considering extending that remit. It was one of the recommendations from this committee's report as well to extend the remit of the DCRP. To look at the tackling of poverty and socialisation framework as well, and I think it would be quite complementary to have that along with the rural white paper, especially with new rural needs bill progressing through. That all government issues would come together, and there would be a foothold in each government department, and a one point of contact. What's the total budget for Tripsy? Um, I think the, in the programme for government, um, it was there was a 13 million. Uh, package to tackle rural poverty and social um, isolation in the last programme. Yeah, that's you, correct. You, yeah, and it was extended for uh, the current year, 15-16, by the, the PFG target was a further four million. In four the million year. for this year. Yeah. More the uh, the, the uh, PUL, PUL funding is not is not uh, been rolled out again this time. Is that the case? Well, at the, um, this now, um, yeah, the, well, that, the, the pull funding, as you know, was, was part of the, the community development element from the, the, the Trip C programme. In the current year, the, the budget for that was approximately um, a million pounds. Um, that the pull programme itself had been extended into 15-16 on the basis that uh, at the end of the year that the, the work would be done. 
in relation to actually mainstreaming that into the mainstream community development. I mean, but proposals are, are, are with the Minister, uh, as Clyde has alluded to, on the action plan, and, and you know, that will include decisions in relation to the likes of pool well, and what community was development. Total, what was the total amount of money going into the pool funding? It was, it was approximately, in, in, in the current year, I think it was about 150000 for pool. It would rather be smaller to a budget of $4 million. Yeah. Um. yeah. Okay. I think, I think just the evaluation, the evaluation of it um, has shown that the objectives have been achieved in relation to pools, so in terms of the, the spend. They, they wouldn't tell me that. That's not what I'm getting from them. Sales, OK. Yeah. John Roger. Th thank you, and you're, you're very welcome. And thanks for your um, point. Um, in terms of when you said about, you know, we're all, I think, aware of rural areas with excellent work that Mara does. Maybe elaborate a bit more on what you mean by mainstreaming the work of Mara. Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, Sean, we're looking at various options going forward. I mean, it's, it's as you know, um, the, the, you know, people may put the point that it's not Dard's job to do all the, you know, Mara, Mara is a multi-agency approach. You have health, you have all our people involved. So it's really to look at that. I mean, what, what Mara essentially was, was using that sort of local knowledge to identify the most vulnerable households. And again, we, we're working very closely with the PHA and others to, for them to actually try to integrate that sort of learning into their, their other schemes, you know, so the people are using that local knowledge. I mean, we've had a lot of success already in, in our partnership on that with DSD in relation to their affordable warmth. DSD were a key partner on the Mara scheme. They've now, they're now rolling out their new affordable warmth scheme, which would have taken a lot of the learning from Mara on board about that need to sort of get out into the target. <coughs> Rural communities, in particular, I mean, the affordable warm scheme has a 60% target now for 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 rural with DSD running. So we see that's very successful. And again, we are talking to DSD and the councils on that affordable warmth to see how. I mean, affordable warmth essentially has you target vulnerable households, including rural. You go up and you knock the door and you go in, and somebody will come along and do an assessment in relation to, to fuel poverty, but also maybe in relation to benefit checks and things like that. So there's there's a I don't want to use the word duplication, but the potential for an element of duplication as to what we do under Mara. So it's really saying how going forward, if that person is in the house, and, and you know yourself, from, particularly in rural areas, people don't like multiple agencies knocking on their door. So it's really to see if, if, if you have a, a skill surveyor in that house, that they can maybe expand that project out to include some of the things that Mara will currently cover. So, so the householder gets that you know maximum benefit in one visit. So it's those sort of things we're trying to do. It's trying to take that, I suppose, that community development approach and, and, and to make sure that all our agencies, when they're out in homes, you know, can actually pick up some of these issues that we're picking up under Mara. But you know, if we take the great work that's been done by Mara and that confidence that's built up with, with the rural, rural community, you think not be of a, of a mind to continue that work of Mara because they, they have such a. They've gathered up over the last few years such a database of information about our rural communities. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we, we, there's been no decision taken not to, to continue the work of Mara at this point. Um, but I think it's incumbent on all of us to see how we can actually, you know, maximise that impact, share the learning, and, and get all our all our uh, all our statutory bodies, in particular, and community volunteers, to sort of to, to take the learning on board and to use the best impact. I mean, so it's I say we haven't decided. There's been no decision taken about the, the longer term future of Mara. But indeed, I think we also have to try and actually uh, work with all our departments to try and bring that learning out there about how to actually, particularly in rural, as you know yourself, to, to, to be able, once you get that opportunity to get, you've identified a household during this maybe vulnerable, you get in there, you have maybe one chance to try and maximise the impact of that visit, and that's more key to do that. Okay, thank you. And in terms of this TRSPI report, was it submitted by the Strategic Investment Board? The evaluation report, yes. Yes. And did Darren get a copy of that? Yes, it's now actually published on the Dard website as well. Yep. Could we copy it? Yeah. That's fine. Yep. Yeah. All right, Mole. Yes, Chair. Thank you, and thanks for your presentation. I think one of the things we we haven't heard um, when we talk about the money, the budget that were spent, etc., etc., mm. and all of this here, but really the amount of money that 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 has accrued. I think far outstrips what it's spent, you know, and that, I think that's one of the big successes of that whole programme. And the Mara project itself, they, they're looking at the new indices uh, areas, and they're going to be looking at the Mara information. So therefore, there's that information getting used there. 
So uh, all in all, it's been one of the big successes. I think it, it took from uh, talking to people who were involved in it, it took them by surprise how much information they got. You know, benefits, etc. The amount yeah. of benefits was brought in, the amount of money that came in through the warm home scheme, all of that there, it was run into millions. Mm -hmm. yeah. for, for the outlay it was, so it, it was a, a scheme well done uh, by everybody. And the first scheme that I saw that it was actually done by those living in the rural areas. It wasn't done by an outside body, it was done by those living in the rural areas for they had, they, they, they had the knowledge of the the area that they were working in, so therefore they got through to people. But the, we talk about the forum that's been set up, Claire. How many's on that and who's going to be on that? Do we um, know? Um, we're, yes, there's the advisory forum. That's yes. what you're yeah, we're, we're com that's what we've proposed to do, and that's certainly something that we'll be aiming to do. Mm -hmm. um, the arrangements for actually what that, how that, what, how that will, yeah. what will work, we will be looking at. But actually, um, you know, as part of this, be looking at how to we talked about the IDCRP and how actually it, it might become a um, a committee that um, has an oversight over a range of rural yes. initiatives. Yeah. Well, equally, while we may have a forum. It may be a forum that could look at a range of rural issues and not just Tripsy, but um, you know, so for for the future, in terms of rural needs. It won't be. It won't be. For example, I'm only thinking off the top of my head here. I don't know. It won't be um, top heavy with say elected representatives. We'd want it to be a broad, um, broad. representative yeah. of the of rural communities and rural needs. I mean, we we'll have a range of people. You know, we even we know who the consultees were in responding to the the consultation and, and those who came to stakeholder events. So there's, there's very clear stakeholders involved that we'd want to be involved. And the last part of it, I, I think, in this rural needs bill goes through. The, the big driver, one of the big drivers in all of us here, will be local authorities. Once they come, once they come in. Rural needs bill comes through. They would have to then adhere to that in, 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 in quite a lot of the ways, you know, as far as the rural areas go. So I think that's a good news story. Well, but I think the money that was spent in the budgets, I think what should be got out is the money that that accrued, and at far outstrips what was spent in the project. I think that that needs to get out to the public. Thank you. Okay. Again, uh, I, I have concerns raised me about the PUL funding in recent weeks, just, and they feel there's still work to be done, so um, it's an issue that I did speak to the Minister on and will continue to try and get that looked at. Uh, I suppose, I mean, to be fair, as Paul said, there, there haven't been final decisions made about um, an action plan. The Tripsy Action Plan, and while we have the consultation on the Tripsy framework, um, the action plan is still to be um, finalised. In fact, so there's discussions going on currently with um, organisations and so on um, before decisions are, are. Okay, well that's, that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. We can't do uh, anything else without the German getting time on Do you want to check or you know? Is that enough to do only that? No, no. Tomorrow's for our bank's board work programme, but we'll put those back on next week. Okay. okay. <coughs> so. We haven't a quorum to do cor the correspondence or the forward work programme, so the members are content. Uh, no, no. Uh, We'll just move on to. Uh, the date and time of next meeting, okay. Um, the next meeting of the Committee of Agriculture and Rural Development will take place on Tuesday, the 8th of March, 2016, at 30 pm in Room 30 Parliament Buildings. I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.